Now, we're so thrilled to be with you uh, for this special weekend. Uh, we love that the family is gathering together for the Easter weekend and just having time of fellowship, building relationships, but also just going deeper uh, in God. So um, if you were here this morning, you met my husband, Mike. My name is Kaylin. And uh, Mike and I have five children. So I'm going to show you a picture of our family here. There we go. Yeah. And what I want to say, if you notice on this picture, that Jesus is literally in the center of our family. <laughs> so uh, that person in the center is our eldest son, Eric. And uh, he's a musician in Los Angeles, songwriter, plays in different bands. And uh, the, the dark-headed uh, brother is John, um, who Howard mentioned this morning, uh, a part of all nations. And he's married to Bethany in front of him. And they, uh, Mike is holding Sullivan, their little boy, and uh, the black t-shirt next to Bethany is our youngest son, Kelly. And then over here, all the girls around us are my daughter Mary's uh, daughters. And Mary and Drew, the blonde-headed ones, they are missionaries in Beirut, Lebanon. And they use, um, if, if, from Logos and All Nations, um, they use the DMM model. Uh, that All Nations uses, that Jim Yost is their coach, and um, they've had quite a beautiful ministry there. And then my youngest daughter is Catherine, and she is an a ER nurse. Both my daughters have their nursing degree. So that's our family. Um, we're very blessed uh, to have them. And on these weekends, I love that I have the family of God you, because otherwise I miss them very, very much uh, on a day like today. So um, I'm going to continue with uh, what Mike started this morning, and we're going to have an experience this weekend of encountering Jesus with a wounded heart. And we all have things that have happened to us and we're going to unpack those so that we can identify. I think some of us walk in denial and a fog and that we don't even realize what we're carrying, a heaviness in our spirit. And I'm praying that God may touch you this weekend. So I have to tell you about a conference that I went to that was very life-changing for me. I was a young mother, and I was in a conference much like this, and a woman came up to me, and she said, I have a prophetic word for you, and the word is, I saw a picture of you, and you were sitting like on a desk, and all around you were flags of the world. And she said, the Lord says of you, you are mother to the nations. And when she said that, I felt a bit like a Mary must have, you know, when the, when the angel came and, and said that she would be having Jesus. I, 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 I pondered this. It's like, I don't even know what that means. I, I don't know what it means. But it, when the word came, it, it felt true but I had no idea what that meant. And I'm, I'm sharing this story because, and I even pray that it happens for some of you this weekend, that a word of God, uh, when it's a true word of God, it, it does come to pass. But it may not come to pass the way you think it was going to come to pass. So I had this word, and this was many years ago, when I was just a young mother, and so I, I just, I didn't know what it meant. Uh, Mike and I had faithfully, we helped lead a church in our town and uh, we gave 
to our own missionaries. You know, we helped support the nations. But I had no grid for this mother to the nations thing. And so as my children grew, they all started uh, going to the nations. I mean, even my daughter, who's ended up in uh, Lebanon, she told us when she was about nine years old that I'm going to be a missionary you know, when I grow up and, and the Lord has called me to a hard country. Take that, moms, for a nine-year-old. That's hard when you hear that your daughter is called to a hard country at nine years old. So, you know, I, I just thought, okay, this is what all this means. I'm mother to my children. My children are going to the nations. And they did. They, all the older ones, they went uh, through YWAM and different mission things, and they went to the nations. And then, probably around uh, 2005, the Lord began to speak to Mike and I about uh, going to the nations, but we didn't really know what that meant. And uh, I'll just fast forward to 2007, is when my daughter was a very close friend to Floyd McClung. And at that point, we really knew that we were going to go to the nations, but we didn't know where or what. And uh, my daughter says, you know, uh, mom and dad, you should check out what Floyd McClung is doing in Cape Town. You have a similar heart. And uh, we didn't know Floyd. And so I wrote Floyd, and Floyd immediately invited us uh, to come. And for all of you out there that got an invitation from Floyd, I know every one of you thought you were the special one. You were the one that he was calling. And that's how we felt. Floyd's like, come, you know, come build with us. So, you know, and, and he has called many. He's such a great spiritual father, isn't he? He's called so many into missions. So Mike and I came down to Cape Town and we helped with uh, Javi, I think I saw him earlier, but Javi and, and a team uh, to start the hub down in Cape Town. So before we jumped off a cliff, because that's what it felt like, we, you know, I had lived in my town. I was born and raised in my town. I went to my university there. I had never really been hardly anywhere. I went to Canada once, I went to Mexico. And I went to Hawaii. That's my experience of ever uh, leaving the United States. And we sold everything. We had a lifetime of, we got, just got in our house the way we wanted it. We sold everything. And we just, it just felt like we literally jumped off a cliff. But it was the best decision. It was the best decision. Because God was calling us. So when we arrived in Cape Town, uh, there was you know, lots of internationals. And not only with all nations, there's many other ministries in that part uh, where we were living over in Kamaki and Nordhuk and that area. And there was many ministries of young people going into missions. And we were training mission, missionaries to go to the nations. That was our call. But what happened was that actually the missionaries needed a spiritual mom or dad. You know, they, they were coming to a new country. They were, they were unfamiliar with South Africa and they had their little babies and, and, you know, they were going through a lot. And some of them were going th through things in their marriage and some things were going you know, on through the teams they were on. It was difficult. They were, you know, we, it's like all these people converged, but no one had known each other. See, I grew up like you, Logos. I had a lifetime of friendships and relationships that built over years. And all of a sudden, when you're called into mission, you're, you're landing. You don't know anyone. No one, no one knows that, that you're a singer, no one knows your skill level, no one knows what you can do in the ministry, you're just all there. So what ended up happening was, anytime you have something like that, where you're really stretched beyond your comfort zone, 
of what you're used to, it brings up things that you, you could cope with before. And now you're finding that maybe I, I have a, I, I'm bursting with anger or, you know, I'm, I'm jealous because God's providing so much more for this person, but I'm giving more. Or, you know, sometimes we, then we have to deal with fear. You know, we, you're, you're now, uh, you feel vulnerable. You're dealing with fear. So we just began, uh, really in 2007, just different ones who sought us out. And we would uh, walk kind of one-on-one with people and help them through their disappointments, their discouragements, their process, you know, um, maybe they've gone through a trauma or a crisis. You know, this all happens. And, you know, then people carry a lot of pain. And we were just a safe place to be able to talk through and help. And I think that's one of the reasons we became kind of spiritual moms and dads. So... Just in that process, it was just a natural unfolding that it ended up that Mike and I began really helping leaders, you know, leaders of ministries and leaders uh, that were being trained. And uh, I think part of the reason that we could do that is that even in our own church, just like you, Logos, you know, when you've been brought up and you've had a mentor walk with you in your Christian life and help you get through some of the things that were tripping you up. Uh, That's what we had. You know, we were in leadership at our church, but we also had those who helped us. So I just wanted to uh, share something of the heart. Uh, I'm going to tell a couple of stories about my life and where that something can happen in our lives and For some, it can be incredibly traumatic, but sometimes it can be just kind of a normal occurrence in life. But but in the experience, we we have a deeper wound that happens in our spirit than actually what happened in the event. And so I'm going to tell you of two events in my life that that's exactly what happened. That the, the more serious wound was in my spirit. So I was like eight years old, and my mother was having a party. She was a a lovely, uh, gentle, kind lady, and we had family over, and the neighborhood kids were out, and, um, you know, we call it the yard, but the garden, in the front, in the garden, we we were playing, and there was a, uh, my neighbor threw me up in the air. This was kind of a game we were playing, and, you know, just... You know, he laid down on his back, and I was sitting on his feet, and he pushed me up. And I, I go way up in the air, and when I landed, I landed on my arm. And so I, I was really in pain, and I, I'm sure uh, I was screaming <laughs> quite hectically because my sweet mother came, and you know, she saw that I was hurt, but she just took me in the midst of her stress in the midst of hosting all these people in her house, and she just took me to my bedroom and said, calm down, just calm down. And she put me in this room and she shut the door. Now, I could have been there 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It felt like eight hours that I was in there. It felt like I was totally alone. I was so much in pain and I kept crying. I was crying and I was crying. And finally, my uncle comes into the room and he begins to kind of talk to me gently. And then he, he says, let me look at your arm. And so, you know, he kind of pulls it out. Well, my arm was broken. It was actually broken. Well, once they figured out my arm was actually broken, everybody got me to the hospital and got me all set and, and all that. But you know what happened in my spirit? Because my mother took me and just calm down, calm down. She's a lovely lady, by the way, (laughs) just so you know. She's a wonderful mother, but, you know, just in the moment. I'm a mother too. I'm sure I did a million of these things. But, you know, what happened in my spirit was, you are too much. 
you are too much. That's the lie that came into that eight-year-old spirit that I was too much. You know, I need to calm down. I'm, I'm, I'm too dramatic. I'm too whatever. And uh, so that's what happened that day. And then, like, fast forward a year later, I get invited to my next-door neighbor. They're having a big reunion about an hour away from our town. And my next-door neighbor was my best friend, my best buddy. And uh, he had, you know, this family. We get to the reunion, and I start feeling very ill, where I feel like I cannot walk. And so I'm kind of laying down. I'm, I'm out of the way. I'm kind of out of the way, but I'm laying down. And, and the kids are trying to get me to play, but it's like I, I actually just can't walk. And uh, I was kind of embarrassed because, you know, it's like a party, everybody's playing. And then the mother of my best friend came over to me and she says, you are just trying to get all the attention. That's what you're doing here. You're just trying to get all the attention. Well, first of all, I was just, I was humiliated and I just was quiet. But even with her saying that, I could not make myself get up because in reality, I had what they call a ruptured appendix. So I don't know if you know what that means, but it's very serious. So when they, when they got me home and my mother saw, I started having fever and then it's like they took me to the hospital and I was in the hospital for a while because the poison was in my body and it was, they had to drain out the poison. So interestingly, both of these experiences in my life, I was truly physically hurt. I actually broke my arm and then I actually had a ruptured appendix. Okay, so something actually happened physically in both of those scenarios. But what came again? It re-emphasized the year before when she says, you're just trying to get all the attention. And so what it did in my spirit again is it reinforced that lie, I'm just too much. I am just too much. And so, you know, then it just kind of got me on a road where I was living a bit as a people pleaser and not really able to be myself because, you know, I felt, I felt that, you know, I'm just too much for people. So I'm using that as an example because uh, there's many stories, and I'm sure there's many stories in this room, of, of things much more severe than what I went through but just to let you know how sensitive we are. You know, our, our spirits can take on something. And so what ended up happening is I begin to believe that lie and you kind of leave, live in a little bit of guilt. And, um, and then many years later, kind of through inner healing, I didn't even know at the time growing up. That was not a conscious thought uh, that I'm living under. It was happening. So in other words, my actions were reflecting that what, what had come into my spirit. But it wasn't until someone spent time to pray with me that I realized there was a lie there that I believed I was too much. And it was so incredible the day that uh, the person praying with me, we broke that lie off my life and then we prayed, God, what is the truth about me? And he said, you're not too much for me. Isn't that beautiful? It, I mean, it just healed me. And he then said, I delight in you. I made you. You're not too much for me. And from that moment on, that whole thing was just lifted off of me. And I think sometimes we don't realize the lies that are affecting our destiny that we carry from a wound. You know, it, uh, these lies need to come to the light so we're not held back. Uh, when Mike and I uh, were called into missions, uh, it was out of Isaiah 58, verse 6 through 12, 
But the themes of that, you should read it over the weekend because it goes with our weekend. But, you know, it talks about uh, loosing the chains of injustice, setting the oppressed free, breaking every yoke, doing away with blaming others and gossip, and coming into the whole part at the uh, bottom. Oh, whoops, I took the wrong thing out. Uh, coming into the bottom is, is being uh, full of restoration, of being a, a repairer of the walls. And so this was what God called uh, Mike and I when we had uh, a scripture into the nations. And isn't that just the essence of who Jesus is? I think many times when he gives us a word, you know, that maybe you have had a prophecy over your life and you haven't even seen the fulfillment of that. And, and you're just living your life and you're thinking, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what that was. But it is germinating in there. And, and maybe God has even given you scriptures that he's called. And let's bring those out. Let's look at those. Because a lot of times when God gives us a scripture... It's always the essence of who he is. And that's who we will be in him. So we are meant to be vessels of blessing, vessels of healing, restoring the broken. We're to even be filled with living water, rivers of living water. And to be able to do this, we need to get healed first inside those places. And you know what? I am not, I am not in my 20s anymore, if you notice. And, and I say, I always need the Lord. It doesn't matter how old we are. We always need the Lord. We always need to have his healing touch over. We never arrive because we are imperfect people. We always need him. We need the unforgiveness. We need healing from rejection. You know, sometimes we've been rejected so much that it seems like we attract rejection. You know, it's almost as if a sign is on our head, reject me. You know, it's like it happened in youth and, you know, nobody picked me. And, and then it just set up a pattern that seems like I'm always the one people overlook. Or I'm, I'm just the one that they never invite in. And it's this pattern. And we, then we begin to dwell on it. And it just, it's like we attract rejection. But if we get healed from that root of rejection... That no longer happens. We don't, ret we don't attract it anymore. So Mike said uh, in the first session, you know, I love uh, when we were talking about when Jesus uh, died. And I think in my young uh, life, and I thought, well, Jesus, you know, he's the son of God. And so you almost think, did he just hold his breath for three days in that tomb? You know, no, he was actually dead. And so then what it shows, because he was really, really dead, the power of the mighty God who raised him from the dead. He raised him from the dead with his power. It, and it even talks in the, in the scripture about the exertion of that power of God to raise Jesus from the dead. And good news, church, that power resides in us. So this is a beautiful uh, scripture that, that encapsulizes this. And I love this scripture. And I love that it says, let the eyes of your heart. It doesn't say, let your, your intellect know. It says, let the eyes of your heart be enlightened in order that you may know the hope that he's called each of you and the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. He has incomparably great power for us who believe. And that power 
is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ up from the dead and he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, every name that is invoked, not only now, but in also in the one to come. God placed all things under his feet and he appointed him to be head over everything in the church. Can we say amen? Amen. 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 And this is what we have inside of us that we can have that power that will help us get over our rejection, our pride, our anger, our anxiety, our unbelief, our isolation, all of it. He will, he will give us the healing that we need. So one of my absolute, I'm just stunned that the Son of God who died, and then he raises again. And, and if you were here in the first session, Mike says, and he told the disciples exactly what was going to happen. But they were all in confusion. They were all scattered. And so I want to read. This is one of the very first things that Jesus did after he rose again. I'm going to read to you... Uh, so you can listen to this or you can follow along in Luke 24, 13 through 25. It says, now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. And it was about seven miles or 12 kilometers from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their face downcast, and one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem? that do not know the things that have happened here these last days. What things, he said. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet. He was powerful in the word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who is going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since this all took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. And they came and they told us they saw a vision of angels who said, he's alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just like the women had said, but they did not see him. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all the things that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which he was going, Jesus acted as if he were going to go further. But they strongly urged him and said, stay with us. It's nearly evening. The day's almost over. And so he went and he stayed with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he began to give it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? 
And they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem where they found the 11 and those with them assembling together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and he's appeared to Simon. And then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Okay, I love this story. You know, we don't even know the name of the second disciple. He's like a nobody. He's like you and I. He's just like a normal guy. These are normal guys. And Jesus thought them so valuable. In their confusion, walking away from Jerusalem, they are shattered. They had a betrayal from a team member. They had a denial of Jesus from one of their leaders. They witnessed a violent death of Jesus, their Lord, who they hoped was going to save Israel, and they could do nothing about it. They were so confused and so shaken up, they didn't know what to believe, and they are walking on a road, and Jesus found them right there. And he wanted to hear their story. Tell me what's going on. He listened right where they were. But I also love what Jesus says that he's listening to them and then he points them to the truth in the scriptures. But he was going to walk on. Can you imagine He was going to walk on. It took their invitation, please come stay. So what I want to say to all of us is when we're going through something like that, a betrayal, a denial, we've witnessed something traumatic that's shaking everything that we believe, where we've gone through hardship, pain, we're shaken that even our purpose that we felt called to, that destiny that we had in God, and it is shaken as well. And in Jesus pointing them to the truth, they didn't recognize him until he got invited in close. Come to dinner. (laughs) Come to dinner. It was when he started breaking the bread, they saw him in his glory. And that's what I want to say. With us, we, we, sometimes we don't recognize him. We don't recognize him speaking. We don't recognize his fingerprints when we're going through such difficulty. You know, I love the story on this because they told him the facts. It's like, okay, here's the deal. You know, I don't, I, I don't know how you don't know this, but, you know, here's the deal. And they tell him the facts. But then they said, we had hoped. We had hoped. It did not go the way they thought. They had no expectation that this is the way it was going to be. So I just want to just take a pause just for a moment. Just close your eyes and just ask the Lord, Lord, what had I hoped Let's just ask him. And if you have a paper, you might want to write it down. I can probably safely say that all of us have had hopes dashed. You know, there's a scripture... In in the Psalms, it says, a hope deferred makes the heart sick. We can actually get heart sick when we've hoped in something and it gets dashed. So I do really want you to pay attention to what you had hoped. Because sometimes what we do in, in this life, and I am one of them, sometimes the way I cope with my disappointment or, or you know, my, ho- my hope being dashed is I get busy. I just start getting busy or I do things like, you know, 
just fill my time so I don't have to actually think about it. But that's not what it's about. You know, we need to actually, just like Jesus did, talk with him about it so that he can open our eyes and we can see what he's saying and that he's with us. There is a part that we must always play. And that is, what do we need to do? We need to cry out. Just as they were walking along with uh, Jesus and they actually asked him to come in closer. Come to dinner. We need to ask God. So I love these two verses, and it says, the first one is in Lamentation. It says, arise, cry out in the night. Do we even know how to do that? Sometimes we're so polite, and we've been, you know, we've been uh, raised to be quiet and to be polite and to be, you know, he's saying cry out. And he's also saying shout, shout my name. You know, there's some real expression in being a follower of Jesus. He's saying, cry out, arise, cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint from hunger at every street corner. <clears throat> I, one of the things I love when they're saying, uh, do it even for your children. You know, if you are bound with something, it can go down generations. You know, you, you can see that, that uh, you know, if somebody has a struggle in, in something, a parent, and maybe the child would struggle in the same thing. If you are free, if you get healed and free of what is holding you, that can be a great blessing to your children. And then in Psalm 62, 8, it says, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. So, just as I told you my, my story uh, of, uh, when I was a little girl, um, what happens is that we can look through life what we call through colored lenses. So my lens about my own life was that I was too much. And so, you know, I begin uh, kind of orientating my life to be a people pleaser. You know, I, did, I wanted people to like me or whatever, and so... Uh, you know, that became kind of an idol that God uh, set me free. But we can have colored lenses when we've gone through a, a trauma and, and a pain and hurt, and we see the whole uh, world through that. If we, if we felt like we're in lack and God hasn't provided, it's like, well, you know, God provides for everybody, but not for me. And we can just look through a lens of, uh, bitterness and pain. And, and it's like the, these glasses, every experience that we have, we're looking through those glasses. We, it's like we had an expectation and it didn't happen and now, you know, we look through a, a lens. We had a, a friend years and years ago who just had a certain theology and he held on to it, but God did not come in the way of his theology. And for some people, you can let the Lord show you who he really is <laughs> and grow into that. But that particular man, he was so bent on his theology that he said, if God doesn't come in this way, I'm leaving him. So he, he left the Lord because God did not come in the way that he, his theology said he would. Yeah, I wanted to just tell you one uh, 
funny story. Uh, Mike and I uh, went to another conference in uh, California, and we were called up for a prophetic word. And, you know, Mike's tall. He's standing beside me. And the prophet comes over. He kind of bypasses Mike, and he goes right over to me, and he, he puts his hands on my head, and he starts saying the words, I mean, he must have said this 30 times. He said, authority, 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 authority. And I'm sitting there, you know, he's there, and I'm like thinking, I think he got the wrong, like, here's Mike. I think you stepped over one too far. You're actually talking about my husband. Because I would say about Mike, as long as I've known him, I met him when I was 18, but he has always known who he was in God. And he's always known who God is. And so he carries that authority. And so as this guy is saying this 30 times over my head, I'm thinking, oh, well, I guess I actually do need this. <laughs> because Mike actually knows that he has authority. And, and so I realized, wait, wait, wait. I am a daughter of God. And, I, I, and my favorite scripture is, I live and move and have my being in him. Isn't that the most beautiful? We live and move and have our being in him. So if I am in him, I have his authority. It's his authority just flowing through me. And, and many times we're all so bound up in, you know, in us that we don't realize who we are and what we have to give. So again, I just want to relate that many times our expectations, you know, I think sometimes we read the Bible and uh, like even when Mike read this morning and, and, uh, and it, it explains how Jesus told exactly what's going to happen and then it says they didn't get it. They didn't comprehend it. And so, you know, sometimes as us, you're reading the Bible, you're thinking, ah, those stupid people, they just didn't get it. I mean, he told them what was going to happen and they didn't get it. But we're on this side and we saw, we got to see what happened we weren't walking through the moment. You know, they've been walking with Jesus. He's doing these miracles. You know, he's, you know, the blind are seeing. The, you know, the deaf can hear. You know, this, all this incredible experience with Jesus. He's walking on water. And then he's saying, they're going to kill me. And they just don't get it. But I want to say, I think we don't get it. I think we get our mind about what God is going to do with us or how he's going to come to us or we even have expectations like that man did of how God was going to be in his life. And he got so narrow, we can get so narrow about what we expect of God that we miss him. We miss him. So I, I just want us this weekend to be a little open here. And especially those places where you really are struggling with confusion and that you've been wounded and, and maybe you've been extremely criticized or you've gone through a crisis and the pain is real. It is real. I've, I've been through it. I've lived a life. I know the pain is real. But God wants to speak. He wants to speak to the pain. He wants to speak the truth. And he wants his people free. So I, I just have a little thing here. Um, I'd like you guys to just uh, close your eyes for a moment. And if I ask you, okay, uh, picture a whale in your mind's eye. And if I said that, you'd just see a little, you'd see a whale uh, in your mind's eye. And with all of us here, I'm sure the whale would look different. But I'd like you to close your eyes, and I want you to picture Father God. Just picture him 
in your mind's eye. And then just note, uh, if you have a paper, you might uh, write down what you're seeing. But also, can you describe how you're feeling in this picture? Then I want to ask, where are you in this picture? So you're seeing God. What are you feeling? And where are you in this picture? Okay, so I just am going to ask you to repeat this after me. So we're going to say it all out loud together. So would you say, Dear Father, is there a lie I'm believing about you? Okay. If you, if you hear a lie, you might write that down or keep it in your mind. I'll just take a little time for you. Okay, and then repeat after me. Father, I break this lie off my life. Father, what is the truth? And then will you write down what he tells you? So the truth sets us free. Just as he was speaking on the road to Emmaus, you know, they, after hearing that encounter with, with Jesus, when they were walking with him, when he spoke to them, they began to be revitalized. They were renewed. They were able to go back to their mission. They had their purpose back in life. They knew who they were again. They weren't lost in confusion. This is what God can do when he speaks truth to us. So um, that little exercise I gave you, and for some of you, you might need to spend a little more time. That was quite quick uh, that we did that. But to just spend time looking at the picture that you have and describing what you're, what you're seeing in your mind's eye. And the reason I tell you this is many times we have a view of God like our earthly father. So if our earthly father was not there for us, or he abandoned us, or if he was distant from us, or if he was a harsh father, many times, even it's subconscious that we've been connected, we connect that view to how we relate to God. Now, a few years ago, I did this exercise, and here I am, I, my whole life, I've given my life to Jesus, I, I've been serving the Lord, I was a missionary in South Africa, you know, what? When I closed my eyes, I saw God the Father, and I was far away. That was my picture, Miss Missionary, Miss Give It All to God. I was far away. And the Lord revealed to me uh, through this mentor that was praying for me. She said, tell me about your relationship with your dad. And I said, well, my dad, you know, he was a good man, but, you know, he just... He was a workaholic. He just worked all the time. He was never around. He was a good provider. He, he worked hard, but I, wasn't, I didn't see him much. And he missed 
all my special events. I was, you know, a dancer, singer, performer, you know, any special event I had, he was unable to come because he was working. So what does that say? He loved me, but that's not what it felt like. It felt like I'm distanced from you, you're not important. And many of you have had much harsher things that happened with your father. Maybe very harsh words spoken to you by your earthly father. Maybe rejection. Maybe he actually left. Maybe some of you have never met your father. You know, and that can make us view God, that that's the kind of God he is. He's, he's not there for me. I'm not important to him. He's harsh with me. So can we all say this together? Can we say, Father, you are not like my earthly father. That's one of our first steps to healing, is realizing that God, our heavenly father, is not like our earthly father. And many of our earthly fathers, you know, they tried their best. You know, and, you know, I think Mike and I, you know, we... We just gave our lives to our children. I mean, we, in every way, tried to be the best parents that we could be. But I'm sure if you ask any one of our kids, we did something that hurt them or disappointed them. It's just the way of life. So our earthly fathers are not like our heavenly father. And God wants to touch some of those things. He wants to touch some of those deep things. And he, just as Mike was sharing this morning, Jesus called him Abba, Father. Abba, Father. A close name. He's not that far away God that's just waiting for you to make a mistake so he can bop you on the head. That is not our Father. Yeah, um, I have a, a, a little song that I want to end with here. Uh, and I, I, what I want to encourage you, uh, I'd like you to listen to this song, but, you know, if some of you just need a little more time to just kind of pray and, and, and maybe God touch some things in your heart, stay, stay here in the sanctuary if you just want a little more time, a little more prayer time. Um, but after the song, uh, you are free to go, you know, for your lunch break. But if you're done, go on out of the sanctuary and we'll just leave the sanctuary, you know, for those that are, are kind of going deeper. Because maybe God touched you with uh, the hearing that, you know, I'm actually not okay. I think it's one of the best steps to healing is to admit I'm not okay. You know, sometimes in this world, we can just put on this smile and I can... Uh, dress up. One of my very best friends came to South Africa and we put on a women's event and she looked gorgeous. She had all her pretty skirt on and her scarf and, and she, as she began talking to the women, she starts taking her scarf off and she starts taking this off. She starts taking this off and she's left with just this black leotard. And she says, you know, uh, the speakers, they, you know, they all like to look dressed. But let me tell you, this is who I am. I am a black backdrop to this diamond that God has had to polish. She'd been through such suffering. She said, here's the real me. This is the real me. Here I am in my little overweight body, in my black leotard, not the beautiful uh, speaker. But my life, it's been a black backdrop to that diamond that God is, is shining. So I just want to encourage you this weekend that, you know, we've been praying for you guys for months. I've had my prayer partners praying for you. I have Jeffrey's Bay praying for you. Just don't miss this opportunity. Don't keep pushing the pedal to the metal, just getting in the car uh, and just going fast. Take the time and seek the Lord. We're going to go deeper in the next sessions of, of how to even uh, face some of these things that are inside. We'll get even more 
uh, to unpack how God is going to set us free. Are we ready for the song? Great. This is a fabulous song. Just let it wash over your spirit. Um, Yeah, it's what we were talking about. So Father, we just invite your Holy Spirit into each life here. Lord, will you highlight any harmful way within us, any lie that we believed about you, any lie we believed about ourself. Father, just bring new wine, Father. Bring new wine over our life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.